Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Tracker like Clayton here from XY Advisor, chatting with my new uh, internet friend, Kate. How's it going? Awesome. Awesome, Clayton. How are you? Yeah, very good, very good. So, uh, so it was like yesterday um, because, you know, we've got this new platform and, and, and we're sort of starting to set up secret groups and so helping segment, uh, you know, the, the global population of financial advisors into probably a little bit more specific to their geographic location. So I went through and I sort of tracked down everyone that was uh, on the platform from the US and I opened up a US uh, group and um, you were like one of the first to sort of get in there <laughs> and, and, and comment and I was like, whoa, who's this absolute power pocket rocket? So, um, so I thought I'd reach out and it's uh, great to connect. Yeah, and what are we, uh, 14 hours later, we're, yeah. we're here, we're brand new internet friends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I just have to say, I, I love that new platform. I love that it's, you know, separate yeah. from Facebook. I was on that yeah. platform, uh, and yeah. I was thinking this morning, I was like, I kind of feel like eight-year-old me, that I was like, I got invited into a secret group. <laughs> <laughs> feel all special. So thank you for that. You let me into the secret club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it is a, it's a really... Um, I guess that sort of, you know, I, I don't know how long um, you've been a part of the XY community, but like it's taken about six years to get to this stage. And at each stage, you know, up until really recently, up until sort of mid last year where we received some uh, seed funding, it was really just a hobby that we did for a long time and that we were actually putting our money into. So we, we had all these loans to the company and not getting paid oh. for anything. And it was pretty tumultuous. <laughs> yeah. Um, but advisors kept asking us to go. So we've ended up here. Um, but you know, like that, that's, that's a whole other thing. I actually really want to find out about someone like yourself. You were one of the first fee for service people in the States. And then my sort of small amount of understanding is you're quite involved with, uh, the FPA and being around the world sort of chatting to advisors and on, on a, in, like on a standards level. And so you've probably got a really good idea of whether the global advice is headed. So this is such a valuable conversation. Yes. Well, where the global advice is headed is all over the world. It's so fascinating to think about how much things change culturally, uh, regulatory, regulators, and I think you guys know that maybe oh, yeah. better than anyone in Australia <laughs> right now, how much yeah. they can impact yes. sort of what's happening in the advice market. Technology is so, so fascinating to see, you know, even in emerging markets, how it's evolving. But globally, I would say we're really on an upward trajectory. And that's why I love, you know, what XY is building. Uh, the podcast that I'll be launching in a few weeks is really about this thirst and this hunger, and you alluded to it, of advice all over looking around going who's doing really cool things who's innovating in all these different spaces how can we all collaborate work together share and really build this profession to what it was always meant to be and I think Clayton our generation absolutely is you know determined to make that happen yeah absolutely and, and that is I guess one of the weirdest things that I've found being involved with XY now for, for a while is that this conversation is happening everywhere. And, and like there's pockets, I guess, because financial planning is not massive, but it's such an important, important uh, profession to get right yes. that people are really passionate about it all over the world. And yes, there's regulatory issues in this country and that country. And, and you know, it's come from sort of a background of maybe a rudimentary view of, of what it could be, but it's a, all over the world. It's sort of coming out of that, you know, it's, a, it's, it's evolving out of what it once was and uh, it's becoming really complex. Um, 
What's some of the trends that you see across the world that, um, that of advisors that are offering a lot of value to their clients? It gets really into whatever you want to call it. And I, I love the terminology is always a little different depending on where you are, but you know, the life planning, the goals based, the holistic, it's, it's what I would just call financial planning. And to step back for a minute, that kind of gets into, you know, my story. And you mentioned I started one of the first sort of fee for fee only, completely virtual fee only subscription model practices in the U.S. back in early 2013. And it, it was because I don't have a background in finance or economics or business. I actually graduated RMIT Uni in Melbourne with a degree in photography. So the totally natural path into oh, really? With being a CFP professional. <laughs> it is, yep. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yes. that's so interesting. I wanted to be wow. a travel photographer. So, travel so has website. always been. <laughs> oh, right. So, uh, and I have noticed that travel and, and advice or advisors go really well together, but you must have had like a really stunning website. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> no, just stock photography, you know, purchase off Shutterstock. <laughs> I did, I did. It was, you know, kind of kind of sad. The really funny thing about that is that in the time that I was going to uni and getting my degree was the height of the shift between film and analog and digital. And I walked away from photography because everything was moving so far digital that I didn't feel like it was the heart of what photography really is, capturing the light, you know, being patient. And what's so funny about that is now what I do, what I'm passionate about is completely leveraging technology, embracing technology, you know? So it's funny kind of past life me was like, technology, you're ruining, you know, how photography should be. And now I'm like, no technology, you can help us make financial planning and engaging clients and, and making financial planning fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's kind of interesting. I, we're using a lot of the same words and, it, and it's basically like financial planning, the mandate of financial planning is so important to not get right. So that's kind of like, you know, the purpose of why financial planning exists is, is so important to get right that it, there does need to be a lot of time and focus spent on it to make sure that it does get to where it needs to be. Or I like to say, you know, it's the most like great financial advice is the best thing you can buy. Like, like, yes. uh, and I'm super, I'm super bullish on, on face-to-face human advisors. And one of the things that I find interesting about your story is that um, there's, a, there's a weird intersection of sort of creativity and personal skills, um, technology and ability to deal in numbers, which I think universally are the ingredients to make a really good advisor. So because money is such an emotional topic, even though it's dollars and figures and digital, um, it's actually like such, such an emotional topic that it's almost more akin to you know, counseling than it is banking. Yes. Um, and so I think probably your photography background would have, it sort of sets the scene in, at least in my mind that you're the type of person that is intuitively, you know, uh, you know, trying to, I guess, connect with people on more of a, a, a human level. And the fact that you made this really cool business model, which I'd love to hear a little bit more about, does not surprise me at all. So you, you spoke about fee-only and subscription-based. Yeah, so kind of, I, I got kicked out of Australia. So if anyone's listening that wants to, you know, get me that permanent residency I thought I would have, <laughs> let me know. But after I graduated, I had to come back to the US and my mom actually owned an investment advisory firm. And I quickly became her retirement plan in that I was being groomed to take over the practice. And yes. I, you know, so I had, I had very interesting um, sort of, uh, access that most people don't have, you know, being as young as I was, I was running all the day-to-day operations. I saw all the service we offered. I did all the billing so I could see what we were charging people and what they were getting for that. Yeah. And over time, I just kept looking around because it was investment advice only. And I was like, 
this just doesn't intuitively make any sense to me. Why are they paying us to do what we do? Like it's, it's not worth it. I mean, don't get me wrong. It was a great business model, created a great lifestyle business, but in my heart, I didn't believe it. And I started going into companies and doing one-on-one employee financial advice. And I talked with everyone from, you know, your hourly employees to your executives and every single one of them, you know, was having questions around getting married, having a baby, retiring, paying off credit card debt, having a special needs family member. They weren't asking what the stock market was doing. And they kept asking me, you know, where do I go for help? And I was like, I, I don't know. I honestly had no idea. And so I came across financial planning. I learned about um, the CFP designation. I went through that whole, um, you know, all the, the training for that. And it was interesting before I sat for the CFP board exam, I learned that traditional financial planning was creating this 80 page document filled with graphs and charts and telling a client where they're meant to be in 40 years. Yeah. And that like blew my mind. I almost didn't sit for the exam because I was like, if this is what financial planning is, I don't want to do it. Yeah. Like that, my creative, you know, photography, artistic brain, I was like, no, that doesn't help people. That doesn't make any sense to me. And so I just started looking around and I was like, I feel like financial planning should be helping these hundreds of people I've talked with over the years, figure out what their goals actually are and then meet them. And knowing that life changes, nobody has any idea six months from now, are you going to get divorced? Are you going to lose a family member? Are you going to lose your job? You know, life is always happening and you need that coach there with you to help you through all of those things. You know, you can't say what's going to happen 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, but I didn't find a practice that was doing that. And ultimately, as I kept thinking about it, I remember exactly where I was on the freeway at a on-ramp to the freeway, sitting in Seattle traffic. And I thought, I'm going to create a practice that I would want to work with if I was a client. Yeah. And so I thought, I was like, I don't want to pay assets under management. I don't want to pay commissions for anything. I want to know that my advisor planner is there right there with me, no conflicts of interest, you know, paying in a way that makes sense to me. And I want to be able to work with them at any time. So I was like, I'm not charging AUM. I've never actually sold anything, so no commission. And I just started with a monthly subscription model because I wanted that ongoing relationship. I didn't want, you know, one-time fee for this huge financial plan. I wanted to build an in-depth relationship with my clients so that they knew as life changed, I was there, we would work through it, and the plan would evolve as their life evolved. Yeah, that's awesome, right? So... I think a lot of this sort of stuff comes from that, I guess, the internal conflict that exists in in a lot of advisors that say, okay, cool, like it's my job to make sure that your investments and your money situation is uh, in its best shape possible. And that is like, it's almost like that's ticket to the ball game. You know, like that is... Uh, considering now with especially with the rise of information around investments around sort of passive ETFs there's the, you know you can sit in that sort of top first or second quartile of performance simply just buying the market yeah. um, and so there's there's sort of less value in in stock picking and, and, and investment picking than they than there certainly once was you know if you go back sort of 10, 20, 30, 40, you know, especially if you start going down down the decades, it, it becomes cloudier and cloudier. And, and I'm sure that value was, you know, worth it back then. But these days, it's a little bit different. So you get a lot of advisors that say, well, I need to be doing something else. And um, my life genuinely has problems that need advice and need help. So where do I go to get that? And it's a super interesting um, point in time when that you asked that question and you answered, I don't know where to answer. I don't know where you go because like that's <laughs> kind of the exact situation <laughs> that I was in, you know, a fair few years ago. Um, I think maybe like even before I started and I had my own financial planning business, uh, this, this, this client looks at me and he goes, that's great, Clayton. Thank you for figuring out my retirement. Thank you for figuring out where my investments should go now. Thank you for, you know, figuring out my insurances. And he goes, 
But like, is there anything you could do to help me for my life today? Like that's really the words that he used. And I, I went, uh, I'm going to have to think about that one. Like, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. So I, I then had to, you know, I, it took me a fair few years, but in the end I ended up creating sort of like this lifestyle and financial management framework that, um, yeah, that, that clients really appreciated. And I ended up getting a lot of people that work in finance. So a lot of, you know, people that weren't financial planners, but worked in finance, um, quite liked the way that I did things because I, I wasn't exactly like the best hand holder, but I really focused on sort of short term um, outcomes. So like, what do you want out of life and how do we achieve it? Like I was really sort of big on that accountability piece, although potentially the tone of my emails could be better. That's, uh, <laughs> We all learn and evolve over time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would literally get clients writing back going, are you okay? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm just, you know, telling you how to run your life, that's all. Um, <laughs> so, so, so let's talk about, um, so you spent, so, you, so at some stage uh, you've got this, you know, uh, business that you've been running for a handful of years and then you end up in South Africa. So yes. So talk to us a little bit about what, what, what's going on there. Well, as a kid, I was kind of a, a drama kid. So I, um, I suppose being a young girl, you just naturally, we're all drama kids. <laughs> I've always been pretty outspoken and I was just really passionate about seeing the profession evolve. And so I was speaking a lot to the media. I was speaking at conferences and I ended up speaking both nationally in the US and internationally. And I got invited quite a few times down to South Africa, which, you know, that that's what I love about this is I wouldn't have thought when I started my practice, okay, a place with a really robust, incredible community of passionate financial planners is in South Africa, but yeah. it is, which is why I've spent so much time there. And on one of my numerous trips, I've probably been there eight times now, I met the CEO of Financial Planning Standards Board, which is, they own the CFP marks everywhere outside the US. So including in Australia, yeah, wow. um, FPA, uh, licenses the CFP marks from FPSB. Right. And I started talking to the CEO. I lived in Denver in the time. The headquarters is in Denver and consulting with them. And then as we just kept talking, I ended up kind of in a whole lot of buckets. I had my practice. I was working with clients. I was speaking. I was writing. I was consulting. I was you know, doing everything I could to kind of push the profession forward. And he offered me an incredible opportunity to work with the, the global CFP professionals. And I was like, well, how can I turn that down? It, it's taking everything I was doing and kind of bringing it under one roof. So I spent the last three and a half years, I was the director of stakeholder engagement, which meant I worked with all of the um, existing territories and countries, uh, which there are 27, and potential new countries wanting to bring CFP certification. So overall, I worked in over 30 countries, traveling around the world about half the time. I had the immense privilege of going to conferences with consumer groups, with international regulators, kind of getting to see all the different sides of the advice marketplace and the diversity of things that was happening, but also all the similarities that are happening. And that's what really pulled me in. Yeah, wow. That, okay, I can fully understand, um, yeah, that's quite like on a much smaller scale, <laughs> certainly <laughs> no one, definitely no one's paying me to speak anywhere around the world, they, they, they actually prefer it if I don't turn up. So, so definitely different to, uh, to, to you in that sense, but um, getting, getting, I guess, drawn into where else advice is headed is something I can 100% relate with. Um, did you spend any time in the UK? I did. Yep. I worked with uh, all the wonderful folks at CISI that, so they licensed the CFP marks uh, in the UK. So I worked with them and uh, I'll always popped through London when I was going to Europe, which was often. I wow. thought about just getting a second place in Europe. I love it there. I love it everywhere. <laughs> You'll learn. There's <laughs> not a country in the world that I haven't found I love yet. I love that, is, that diversity. Wow. That is a, a very good um, view. To take uh, so in in England, um, I know that going through something similar to Australia, but sort of they front run, front ran, front ran. Let's go with yeah. front ran. They front <laughs> ran the um, 
the, the, the problems that we're sort of experiencing over here with compliance, they did it over there a handful of years ago. So what's your understanding of, I guess, the UK market and from your point of view, is there any reflections of that around the world? There are, and that's, that's what I was surprised by, I guess, just because I hadn't ever been on that side. I went to a couple of IOSCO conferences, which is the International Organization of Securities Commissions. And that's like the head of, you know, ASIC and the SEC in the US and FCA in the UK. Jesus. They all come together around the world and talk to each other. Which now I'm like, well, of course they do, but that never actually dawned on me. Yeah. And so as we think about, you know, the world is huge, but it's getting smaller. The regulators are coming together. Us as planners are coming together. You know, everybody's talking. And so it makes perfect sense that, you know, RDR and everything that happened in the UK, well, then South Africa looked at that. RDR came to South Africa. You know, Australia is looking around. So it's happening everywhere, which is why I think it's so important for advisors and planners around the world to be talking to each other and sharing what's happening. Because even if you don't think it's coming to your country or you don't know how or when it's coming to your country, you should make sure that you have a practice that's ready for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and if I sort of look at the trends, where I see advice, certainly in the next decade, it's going to, be, it's going to look something like this. It's going to, you know... I don't even know if there's going to be um, an upfront fee in like I've, I've heard a lot of advisors are even moving away from sort of this upfront engagement fee and just moving straight to a, uh, an ongoing education and service arrangement that has 12 month, um, you know, renewals that's charged entirely from the credit card, not from the retirement savings. And um, and commissions are, you know, potentially going to be completely gone in 10 years. So that's, if I think about the, uh, yeah, where advice is headed. And strangely, if I look at the, the, the best in terms of client acquisition, client satisfaction, um, advisory companies in Australia at the moment, they're already there. So yeah. There are companies and there's a growing number of companies that are already ticking all those boxes and the clients love it. And this yes. is the crazy thing that, because I came from tax accounting and then into sort of like really in-depth legislation style of advice. And then after that experience, which was really like fee for service, um, it was I kind of halfway through my career that I became sort of a traditional financial planner, if you want to call it that. Um, and it, I remember having to learn how to get paid by a client paying something else and then getting a portion of that money. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, why? Like that's, that's a really long way to get paid. Like why, why do you have to do that when you can just ask them for money and do things for money? And, um, and then it's, it, it kind of like we all got convinced that that was the way things worked and now universally across the world, clients and advisors are simply finding that once they've fully decoupled themselves from these, what they see is, I guess, support crutches. They're actually sort of holding them back when they're making this move. Um, there's like this substantial businesses and, and value advice, uh, advice models that are valuable are coming out of sort of this renewal in what financial advice can be is actually mind blowing. It is. And, and it's so interesting to see kind of how different countries, cultures, regulators are handling it. I know when I started my practice, because nothing like it existed, the regulator in Washington state, they had to have special meetings with their in-house attorneys to figure out what to do with me. Because no. nobody had ever tried to, you know, just get a monthly payment. And I got paid directly from credit card. It was on, you know, auto withdrawal. And it was just, it blew their mind. They were wonderful to work with. I really can't speak high enough of them. But it was just so interesting. And, and I see that in a lot of advisors I talk to around the world in countries that, you know, don't have this model yet. But we need to get the story out there of how many advisors in so many countries are doing it and everywhere needs that innovator. 
needs that person that looks around and goes, okay, that's what I believe is right. Yeah. The, you know, clients will come because they will, you know, and, and there are a lot of places where people say, and everybody said it to me before I started my practice, no client's going to want that. You know, you're never going to be successful. That's not going to work. There are now, you know, thousands of advisors in the U.S. with the, you know, near identical business model being completely successful. So I think sharing these stories and sharing what is working is a really great way of inspiring advisors in all corners of the world to look around and go, it is possible. Like we just need that one person to go out and make that leap of faith. Absolutely. You know, I'm like, I said X, Y, we've been banging this drum for ages and just hearing the way that you're talking about with such a global um, view of it, it, it sort of certainly even reiterates it in my mind that it's the way to go. And we like, I've got honestly one of the best jobs in the world. I'll, I'll wake up and maybe a couple of times a week, I'll have, you know, like a really nice email from an advisor that says, Hey man, just listening to the podcast and, um, and it's really helping because, you know, you, you guys are helping to frame the conversation in a way that it's not happening anywhere. Like, anywhere else and and um i am i am aware that it's kind of interesting in in the uk you've got these guys that are called i just found them the other day they're called next gen planners Next gen planners yep. yeah 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 so i just i stumbled upon them the other day and then um through a strange and i still can't figure out how this happened but essentially like almost at the exact same time xy advisor started um xy planning network in the u.s started and that's always been like a really interesting thing is like we're like, how did that happen? But anyway, so, um, uh, and then I'm sure, you know, just looking at those two countries, I, I can almost guarantee that there's probably um, stuff going on in Canada. There's probably stuff going on in South Africa. And, you know, like through this really in de- like individual and independent thing all over the world, it's happening. And, and that just, I mean, it gives me a lot of hope for, for the future. It does. And, and I have long said, you know, it's like there's something in the air because when I started my practice, I discovered about a year later that there were actually four of us, um, three women and, and one guy in the U.S. that had never met or heard of each other that started almost identical practices within six months of each other. And huh. me and the two other women are within six months of each other age-wise like in different time zones. And you're just like, how did that happen? Right. It's just, there's, I don't know if it's somehow our, our uh, generation was born with this gene that like sprouted, you know, five or 10 (laughs) years ago, but no, it's, it's fascinating to see all over the world. Yeah. 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 Uh, And um, I mean, I kind of understand the, like, it, it would be really difficult to say if I was a, you know, a 60 year old advisor and I'd earned income for the last 30 years in a certain way. Like I understand the resistance and I certainly, um, I do have a sympathetic um, view of their situation. Um, but at the same, and, and like, I, I, I hope that as the regulations come through, you know, that things don't end too terribly for them. Uh, we had a report sort of maybe about six months ago where, um, you know, maybe about 15 advisors have killed themselves. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, the, the situation is somewhat bad um, for that sort of uh, type of advice. And um, so I do, I do actually have a, a sympathetic view of it. Um, I just my, – my, my view has always been um, let's change everything moving forward but maybe don't sort of rewrite the past. And so over, you know, over the sort of the next sort of 10, 20, 30 years, everything will work itself out. But, um, and we originally did have that. It was something that came out sort of 2013. It was called BOFA. It sort of drew a line in the sand and said, okay, you can't receive commissions from any investment or retirement products um, from this day forward. But they've just sort of redone the legislation now. And it's like, no, just everything's gone now. So we're sort of, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a dire situation for one segment of, of our planners. And I really hope that, you know, that things don't end up too terribly for them. But uh, at the same time, like, I think the responsibility for financial advisors to the clientele of the world is, 
you know, is to get our shit together and to be able to provide really good advice. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it is, you know, and I've seen that in other places too. And you really feel for the advisors that, I mean, they did the best they could in the, you know, time that they grew up in and with those models. And um, I, I feel for all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a bit of a tough time. But um, shifting over to the fact that you live in Vegas. So I would, imagine, <laughs> I would imagine Vegas would be literally like the place that wants the smallest amount of financial advice in the whole world. So how, how on earth did you, or, or were, you, were you in Vegas when you started the, country, started the company? But it kind of does make sense now that you did everything digital so you could actually talk to sensible people around the world. Yeah, I did. And I did actually end up having clients all over the world. Um, but I started the practice when I was in Seattle, which, where, which is where I was um, born and raised. And then I've lived in California, lived in Australia, but I have never gotten along with the weather in Seattle. So I kind of had a quarter life crisis after starting my practice. And I was like, I can't deal with this anymore. I just up and left, packed what I could fit in my Mini Cooper and just started driving south. And I was like, yeah. I need me some sunshine. And you know where there's a whole lot of sunshine? Here in the desert. <laughs> We've got a lot of it. Uh, the, the cost of living is incredibly low. All my financial planner really? friends, I love them all. Um, the first thing they all mentioned is like, there's no state income tax in Nevada. Uh, so it's very friendly from a planning perspective. Um, the casinos... Wow managed to make plenty enough money so that they don't need to charge any state income tax. So it's a, a good place to live. And it's, it's a lot like California without the water and the high costs of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, in 2016, I went to FinCon. Have you ever been to FinCon? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and it was in uh, San Diego. And, and then I found out while I was there, you know, like a younger cousin of mine was actually in Vegas performing in Circus Soleil. So I literally, I jumped on a plane and flew in just to watch him flip around for a little while. And, no then, I was, and then I was out <laughs> sort of the next day. And then that sort of 24 hours of, um, of, of Vegas in a whirlwind. Oh my God, like it's pretty crazy. Um, so I, do, what's your sort of experience? And did you ever come to Australia to, um, with your work with the, the Global CFP? I didn't, which is crazy. Whoa. So whoever's listening, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, no, I, that's I will take, Dante and Benjamin. I know, and I, I, know, I know Dante well. Um, <laughs> I actually brought my husband down to Australia for the first uh -huh. time on our honeymoon about a year ago. So got Great. down there. We're in Sydney. I called Dante and popped into the FPA office to see everyone. It was great to see Ben and Marissa and the rest of the team. Oh, you are a smooth cat. I like that. You get, you get, and, and because the, the honeymoon was uh, with work, right? Tax deduction. Holla. Nice. <laughs> I like the way you work. <laughs> oh, very cool. And so, um, so with all this experience that you've got, um, you're looking to now take this, uh, and, you know, I believe you mentioned before that you had a little bit of time off um, and it sounds like the, the wedding was a part of that. So congratulations. Um, and so, you're now getting back into it, but rather than um, becoming an advisor again, you're getting more into, well, how can I, and as, as we say at XY, sort of how can I drive the positive evolution of financial advice? So that's yeah. kind of a bit more of your mandate. Absolutely. And that, that came from, you know, the last few years, I have honestly just loved all the places I've gotten to go. I've been to over 50 countries now. I have friends all over the world, the things I've gotten to see. I mean, people are such great hosts everywhere. So some of the experiences have been <laughs> unreal. And working with them kind of at that higher level with the organization that owns the CFP Marks worldwide, um, it was great, but for me, I realized over time, I was a little bit removed from the practitioners. And I really love the practice of financial planning and working with advisors and planners. And I did a lot of coaching and consulting advisors when I first launched my practice back in 2013. And I kind of want to get back into that. So I took a few months off, as you mentioned, thanks to financial planning, planned well and was able to just chill for a few months. And now I'm launching a new platform, really starting with a podcast called Innovating Advice. 
and it's going to be kind of the global pulse on financial services innovation worldwide. And there's sort of six pillars to it, looking at innovation from technology that you use to run your day-to-day practice, FinTech or FP tech, which we dubbed for financial planning technology, uh, business models, diversity within practitioners and within clients, uh, you know, and then can sort of evolving consumer expectations. What do consumers want? How do they want to engage their advisor? How do they want to pay for advice? How, you know, what kind of advice do they want? So building this podcast, interviewing people that cover that spectrum from all over the world to help share those stories. And I keep thinking of, you know, think of somebody sitting in their car in, you know, Africa or Belgium or wherever and kind of going, wow, like that's so cool. I'm going to be the catalyst to do something in my country. Or, you know, I think Australia has so many great stories. I mean, you know them from X, Y, which is why you'll be on the podcast (laughs) 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 to kind of share what's happening because it's interesting being in the U.S. And since I've lived overseas and spent so much time overseas, you know, the U.S. does tend to be a little more insular. You know, there are so many advisors here, 85,000 CFP professionals. I mean, you can't even keep up with everything that's going on here, but we don't always look to other countries to see what's happening. And so I want to bring those stories of what's happening around the world so that we can all work together to evolve the profession, to keep building it, think client first and, and just be what it always should be. Yeah. I, one of the things you mentioned was sort of the rise of the consumer trends and the, like the, the, the fact that we as consumers now get to make uh, more informed decisions and our expectations have um, drastically increased over the years. And I think that's probably, and because I've thought about this a lot, I think that's probably the, the unifying characteristic of this global, you know, whether it's next gen plans, XY planning network, XY advisor, the other guys that are around the world, I feel like the unifying piece of that is the rise of the consumer. And what would I want if I was the client of an advisor? That's kind of you, you sort of, um, and that was because if you go back to to when XY started, we were very much like, well, what's the next? What's the like? How do we figure out how to become a fully fledged advisor? That was kind of the, the premise, and then simply by just giving it a name, um, it it allowed. It was a strange sort of thing that allowed the best advisors that we could find to share what they were doing really well. Yeah, and um, and yeah, it's, and, and it's sort of sort of scaled up from there. But um, so for all the advisors that are um, interested in what you're doing, um, take the take it away. Where do we find you? What's your website? Uh, the website is innovatingadvice.com. The podcast will be launching uh, at the end of February, and will be on all the major platforms: Stitcher, Apple, um, you name it. And over time, I'll be sort of trying to figure out what advisors most want. You know, as I've talked with advisors over the years, I'm getting little snippets of what they want, but I'm really going to be looking for feedback in terms of what would help, what would most help advisors, you know, globally to learn how to embrace technology, understand consumer expectations and build thriving practices that are essentially future proof and also give the advisor a great life. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, look, it's so it's so great to, to meet you and so quickly sort of turn this around and organize the time <laughs> to chat. That's been really fantastic. Um, thanks so much for coming on. I will really look forward to being part of your um, podcast as well. I think you've got a great experience and, um, yeah, super looking forward to, to what you do. Excellent. Thanks so much, Clayton. Thanks for coming on.